Well, I think it's unique that this is uh, this weekend we're talking about wearing white, and I think it's a very good way to start uh, our message through this time of prayer and consecration. Just a quick recap over the last two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I came here, I shared a message with all of you about God's amazing grace, talking about repentance. Last week, Pastor Guang Han taught all of you how you can continue to walk this straight and narrow path. How can you maintain on this uh, a journey of purity and righteousness? Well, I've been seeking God for many weeks actually, on what we should be sharing this weekend. And so, I want us to turn to this weekend's scripture reading, okay? It's from the book of First Timothy. Okay, let's take our Bibles and look at First Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 to 17. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And this is what it says. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honour, glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, this passage here, it's, uh, if you recall, I've actually been, we've been talking about this, is actually what, uh, this is part of First Timothy, which was the letter, the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. And the sermon I have for us this weekend, out of this passage here, is a sermon that I've called, The Chief of Sinners. The Chief of Sinners. This is something that Paul actually alludes to, or he actually, he's very direct about it. Paul, when he was talk, writing this letter, he writes about sin and he talks about how he himself is the chief of all sinners. That's what we just read in that passage just now. And this is actually something that's relevant to all of us here. Because all of us here, if Paul says he is the chief of all sinners, then we too must understand that hey, we are the chief of all sinners as well. Now, what does that mean by that? Literally, he is saying that he is the worst sinner. Okay? It means that he's the most sinful person person on earth. That is what he's saying. He's saying, you look at my history, everything, I'm the most sinful person ever. And I think this should cause us to think for a moment. Okay? If you think about it, Apostle Paul, this guy, this guy who served the Lord so much, who would eventually give his life for, for the gospel. In fact, most of our New Testament is written by this one man. I mean, this guy was so used by God, yet he says this, that he is the chief of all sinners or he is the worst of all sinners. But I think today, we need to come and reflect on our own lives. I believe Paul came to this conclusion because he actually understood how God looks at sin. He understands that no matter what, at the end of the day, he is still a sinner who is unholy, ungodly, unrighteous, and impure. And if you look all throughout Scripture, there are many people in the Bible who talk about this. It's not just the Apostle Paul as well. There's a man in the Bible called Job. In the book of Job, chapter 40, verse 4, Job himself says, Behold, I am vile. Okay? I am, I'm disgusting. I, I am, I'm, I'm so terrible because of that sin in me. I, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, or I am a man of sinful lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And if you go on, Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Peter himself, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I mean, think about it. Here it is. One of the Lord's disciples, when he first met Jesus, would say, Lord, go away from me. Get, get, get away from me. Why? Because I'm so sinful. You cannot be here. I'm just way too sinful. Apostle Paul himself, in another part, in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, he says, What a wretched man I am. If we go out of the people from the Bible, two weeks ago, I talked about this man, John Newton. John Newton was the one who wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace. What, how, does, how does that hymn start? It starts by saying, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. See, today, I want to bring us back to something that maybe we often don't talk enough about. Yes, we talk about the victory over sin. We talk about what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But yet, we don't talk about the severity and intensity of what sin actually is. You know, 
I want to make it clear that today I'm not saying all this. You know, I'm, I'm, today, basically, I'm saying this. I'm saying you are the chief of sinner. I am the chief of sinner. The person beside you is the worst of all sinners. Everybody here, we are all the worst of the worst. That is what the Bible says. But I want to tell you this, you know. I'm not saying this to put us down. You know. I don't want us to hear this and think, wow, you know, yeah, I'm so lousy, I don't, I don't deserve anything. You know, the truth is this. We don't deserve anything from God. I'm not here to put you down. But it's only when we understand how sinful we are, then we can appreciate how amazing God's grace is. In fact, the more I understand how sinful I am, I don't actually feel put down, you know. I feel lifted up. I feel elevated. Because I see that even though I'm so sinful, God still loves me so much. God still cares for me so much. God still desires to work in my life and through my life. I think that's amazing. That I will become enemies with God, but yet God still chooses to love me. That says something, you know, that we have a God who wants to do so much for each and every one of us. And so this is my message today. All of us here, we are the chief of sinners. We are the worst of all sinners. But no matter, even though that's the case, there is still hope. Hope that doesn't come from us, but hope that comes from Jesus Christ. And so the, today, the question I want to explore with all of us is this one question. What hope is there for a sinner like me? What hope is there for a sinner like you, like me, like all of us? What are the two things here? Number one, the first thing I want to share is this. Even though we are the chief of sinners, there is hope because even though I am the chief of sinner, we have a God who is a God of possibilities. Tell the person beside you, say possibilities. See, God sees us and He sees endless possibilities in our lives. That's why grace is so amazing. Instead of looking at us and only counting all our sins, basically it's this, you know, God doesn't just look at us and look at us based on all the problems that we have. He, he, can, he, 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 he could look at us and say, oh, Daniel Kong, he's not a good guy. He tells lies. He was disrespectful to his parents when he was young. He didn't do this. He told lies all the time. He stole money. He could do all that. But despite that, he doesn't just focus on those problems. Instead, he focuses on the possibilities in that person's life. Let me explain this to you. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. No longer counting people's sins against them. Means this, you know, that God looks at your life and my life. He knows everything that is wrong in it, but He doesn't hold these problems or these sins against us. He doesn't, he, he doesn't have all these, He doesn't just count all these lists of wrongdoings against us. You know, I wanna, you think about it right now. Okay, if I were to ask you to think about someone in your family, maybe your pa- uh, one of your parents or, or a sibling or someone, right? I'm sure if I ask you to take out a piece of paper right now or on your phone to write down a list of all the problems of your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your cousin, whatever, I'm sure you can write a pretty long list. You can say all the problems, you know? And you know what? We tend to have these kind of things and the thing is that we often write people off based on that. What do I mean by that? I mean that, hey, after a while, you say, oh, this person is always like that one. Ah. This person always, like, always will tell lies one. This person will always get things wrong one. This person will always cheat me on my money. This person will always be like that. We write that person off. Now, can you imagine if God behaved that same way? That God looks at all our sins and says, oh, this person was always like that one. That means what happens, right, is that there's no hope, you know? That means God looks at you. He sees that you're so messed up. You've got so many problems. And He says, therefore, you don't bother with you. Lah. That means there's no hope in life. But God doesn't do that. That's why He says He does not count our sins against us. That's why I say this. He's not a God who focuses on our problems, but rather He's a God who sees possibilities in your life. We may not see these possibilities. We may think there's there's nothing good can come out of this person's life. But God looks at us and says, Hey, I see tremendous possibilities in this person's life. Let's look at what we read earlier in Scripture. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 14. Paul wrote this. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. He has enabled me because He counted me faithful and putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Now, what I want to pull out here is this. Paul writes these few things, you know. He says he's a blasphemer, He's a persecutor. He's an insolent man. These are not good things he's saying about himself. He's saying that he's a bad person. Why would he say that? Let's go and look at the Apostle Paul's history. 
we first read about Paul in Scripture at, at the instance where another disciple was being killed. There's a disciple by the name of Stephen or Stephen. He was being killed, he was being stoned, and Paul was there. Now, let me just quickly say this to all of us. Um, when you read Scripture, uh, especially when it pertains to, to, to the book of Acts, all right, you read either you read stuff about Paul and about Saul. These are the same person. Okay, this is the same person. Paul basically went by two names. Okay, he had a he had a, a, a Greek name which is Paul, or he had a Hebrew name which was Saul. Okay, it's actually both one and the same uh, person. So if you look at Acts chapter seven, verses fifty-seven to fifty-eight. What happens is this. At this, they covered their ears. They were yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, at this guy called Stephen. And they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They were killing a Christian disciple for preaching the gospel. They were stoning him. And meanwhile, the witnesses or the people who participated, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the first time we, we hear about Paul or Saul, this same guy. The first time we read about him was him being part of a group persecuting Christians and specifically stoning one of the disciples. He was being stoned, and he did not exactly participate, but he was holding the coats of everybody. Like that's what Scripture says there. And then it goes on in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, And Saul approved of their killing him. He was happy that Stephen was being killed because he should, he should have been killed. And if you move on further, this was the mission that Paul gave himself, Acts chapter 8 verse 3. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. I mean, read this a little bit, okay? Read this, leave it up there and think about it for a moment. Just imagine this for a moment. Literally, this, is go, this guy goes from church to church, goes from house to house. He kicks down the door. He finds all the Christians there. He drags them out. I mean, this is like something you read about the Gestapo in World War II or what, how, they, how they persecuted different people groups. That's, that's what Paul was doing. Okay? That's the kind of person he was. But guess what? God is a God of possibilities. You see, God is a God of possibilities, meaning that He can see this man called Paul, He can list out all the problems and say, you know what, this guy will never be able to serve me, I will never be able to use him. But you know what, God is not a God of problems, God is a God of possibilities. He sees the possibilities in His life. And so you go on to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, Paul encounters Jesus Christ, he encounters God in a very spectacular way. But let's look at it in Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still uttering threats with every breath. He was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He went to the high priest even. He requested letters addressed to all the different synagogues asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way or rather Christians he found there because he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. You see, I mean, just this is, how, this is the kind of man he was. He was, he was such an evil man. He would persecute people without any grace, without any mercy. Uh, he would just really wasn't show them face. He would lock them up. He would punish them. And if they get stoned, he's happy about it. And, but you look at something that Paul writes in 1 Timothy. If we come back to do this scripture reading, in verse 13, he writes this, But although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent, insolent man, but I obtained mercy. He said, even though I was like this, I came to a place where I obtained mercy, where I found mercy. He has recounted all the problems he has, but despite that, he received grace and mercy. And he knew this because he, has a, he knows our God is a God of possibilities. I want all of you to listen to this right now. Regardless how messy our problems are, God always sees endless possibilities in your life. Instead of writing you off based on all the problems that you have right now in your life, God doesn't do that. He sees possibilities. So he didn't write Paul off, you know. He didn't write Paul off. He showed grace and mercy to Paul. And if you know how Paul's story goes, okay, he was on this road to this place called Damascus. He encounters Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appears to him in a very bright light. Paul becomes blind, temporarily blind because of that. And he was blind and unable to see. And while, while Paul was blind, God spoke to another disciple called Ananias, asking Ananias to go and pray over Paul so that Paul may one day may, may see again. Lah. But read what happens in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 to 14. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, 
I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Basically, what was happening was this. God spoke to Ananias and said, go and pray for this man. Go and serve this man. Go and, go and reach out to this man because I want to use him. But Ananias is like, how can? This guy is a horrible man. He has done all these horrible things. Basically, to Ananias, he has written Paul off. But then when, when Ananias said that, God replied to Ananias. He said this in verse 15. The Lord said, go because Saul or Paul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. So while Ananias had written him off, you know, said that, well, this guy is a problematic guy. We cannot use him. God, you cannot possibly be using him. But God says this, I don't see a problem. I see possibilities. This guy, I, you may think he's so bad, but I can see what he can do in his life. I can see endless possibilities. And I want to say this, he right now is my chosen instrument. And Paul understood this, you know. Paul, after living his, this life of doing all these terrible things, he sees how God calls him. That's why he still writes this in verse 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I had done all these things, he still considers me trustworthy, appointing me to serve him. And that's why later on he writes and reminds us this in verse 15 that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Today, you know, I want to tell all of you this, you know. You know why I want you to know that you and I are the worst of sinners? Because when we realize that we are the worst of sinners, then we know that God is for us. Because God came, that's why He just said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Luke chapter 5, verse 32, Jesus Himself said this, I have not come to call the righteous, but call the sinners to repentance. See, when we finally realize that we are sinners, that's when we can open up our lives, we can open up our hearts, we can open up our spirits and our minds to who God truly is. So today, I want to tell you this, that if you know that you're the chief of sinners, it's not a hopeless situation. In fact, it's, there's a lot of hope because Jesus Christ is your hope because God is a God of possibilities. And as we talk about that, I remember, I, I, don't, I can't remember if I shared it uh, two weeks ago, but I always come back to this quote. And this quote was by this man, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was a playwright uh, from, from a while back. And he wrote this and he said this, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. See, every sinner has a future. And all of us, when we recognize that we are, we are sinners, that's when we say, God, I need you in my life. And that's when God begins to lead you on His path, bringing you to that future that He has for you. And so today, I want to tell you this. Yes, you may come, you, I'm sure all of us, we can write down a whole long list of all the sins we have in our lives. But today, God's Word says this. He does not count these sins against us. He looks at you. He doesn't count, he doesn't count your life based on all the problems, but rather, He looks at you based on the possibilities that your life has. He looks at Paul and he looks at this guy called Paul and he says, I can count all the problems against this guy, but yet he didn't. He says that there are endless possibilities and he uses Paul in a great manner. So that's the first thing, that's the first reason why we can have hope. That's the hope that we have even though we're the chief of all sinners. Number one, we may be the chief of all sinners, but yet we have a God of possibilities. There are endless possibilities in your life. I want you to look to the person on your left. Look to the person on your right. Look, look right at that person straight in their eyes, all right? And maybe you think, I don't know what you think about that person. Maybe you think that person cannot make it one. Maybe you think that person was wow, so sinful or whatever. But can I say this, you know? What if the person you're looking beside you, what if that person right there is the next youth pastor here in FCBC? I want you to look to the person on your right. Look at the person on your right. The person on your right might be the next senior pastor of FCBC, you know. And you know what? Some of you may think right now, cannot be one lah. This person cannot be one lah. Cannot make it one lah, this person. But you know what? God is a God of possibilities. No matter how bad it is, 
You know, we always like to say this CMI, right, cannot make it. When it as long as, as far as God's concerned, his CMI means can make it. What do you tell the person beside you say can make it? So that's the first thing I want to share with all of you. Number one, we are the chief of all sinners, but we have a God of possibilities. But the second thing I want to share with all of us is this. Not only is there a God of possibilities, but even though we're the chief of all sinners, we have a God of patience. We have a God of patience. Now, I've actually talked about this before. Maybe, maybe not so much here at, at, at youth service, but I've talked about it with the, at our main services. But I've never really unpacked what patience is in the Bible. But I hope that as we look into it specifically, we can get a better idea of who God is and why is it that we have hope in Him, even though we are the chief of, of sinners. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Okay? We read this earlier. It says this, For this very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, or the chief of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. Now, I want you to pause here for a moment. If you recall earlier on, we actually didn't read this word patience. What we just read is the New International Version. Earlier on in our scripture reading time, I read to us from the New King James Version. I deliberately picked the New King James Version because that version uses a very interesting word. Okay, what is that interesting word? Let's look at 1 Timothy 1.16 again, but the New King James Version. It says this, The reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. Now, I like this version because it gives us a richer understanding of what patience actually is all about. You see, when we throw out this English word patience, patience to us, it means a lot of different things. We understand it in a different way. And sometimes we feel like patience is just a matter of, of waiting, okay? Or you need patience to wait for the bus, to wait for the train, to wait for something to happen. You need patience. But it's more than that, you know? The New King James Version talks about long-suffering. I like this because it literally, think about it in English. It's a very easy word to understand. Long-suffering. To suffer for a long time. That's what it basically means. If you're going to look in a dictionary, long-suffering is defined as this. Having or showing patience despite troubles, especially those caused by other people, patiently enduring lasting offense or hardship. That is what long suffering means. And so, I want why, why do I need to explain this to us for a moment? What I'm saying is this you know, that when God is patient with us, it's not just that He's standing there waiting for us. Lah. He's like, maybe, maybe, maybe God thinks, wow. Pastor Roland, wow, you got a lot of sin in your life, you know. I need to be patient with you. And God's thinking, okay, let me just wait. Lah. I just wait until one day Pastor Roland wake up and then he, he come to his senses. But it's not, you know. If any of us has sinned, when the Bible says that God is patient with us, God is actually as good as God suffering. That God is hurt when we have sinned in our lives. God is angry when we have sinned in our life. God is in pain when we have sinned in our lives. And as long as we continue to allow that sin to remain in our lives, God is not waiting patiently and comfortably. He is very, uh, let me see what's the best way to put it. He's very gao okay? He's very, it's very difficult. He cannot stand it. It's, he's, it's as good as he's suffering. He's in pain. He's not enjoying it. That's why the Bible talks about long suffering. You see, one thing is this. We don't understand how God actually views sin. God cannot tolerate sin at all. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. The prophet there says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. See, he talks about God's nature, you know. God is so holy, God is so righteous, God is so pure that he cannot tolerate any sin at all. Now, what does this mean? mean? Well, this, this, this pales in comparison, but it's somewhat similar. I'm sure all of us here, in your own life, you have your own pet peeve. What's a pet peeve? Something you cannot stand. Something you cannot tolerate. Everybody, we have different things. Some people, our pet peeves is you, you can't... How I many of you here, you cannot stand it when people chew with their mouths open? Right? I see some of you putting your hand because I see some of you very proud to put up your hands. Okay, over there, I feel you, brother. Okay, I see your hand there. You're safe. Okay. Uh, I'll say this first. It's one of my pet peeves as well. I can't... I, I can't I, I cannot stand that, okay? I, it's, it's a pet peeve, all right? Every one of us, we have our different pet peeves, okay? Some people, their pet peeves, they cannot stand people who tell lies, they cannot stand people who steal, they cannot stand people based on some way they behave or whatever they do. 
Now, I want you to pause for a moment. Whatever your pet peeve is, when someone is doing that precise thing, how do you feel? You don't feel very shook, right? You don't feel very happy. You feel a certain sense of unhappiness. You feel a certain sense of irritation. You even feel a certain sense of anger. And some of you, you will reach a point that you really cannot tahan anymore. You will talk to that person and say, Hey, can you stop doing that or not? Can you chew with your mouth closed or not? Can you don't do this? Can you don't do that or not? Can you stop? It's just so irritating, you know. We will come to that point, okay? Now, this pales in comparison. But it's almost like, it's almost like that's how it is when we have sin in our lives. That God cannot tolerate this at all. That when you have sin and God is sitting there with you and He sees you having sin in your life, He's disturbed by that. He's uncomfortable with that. It's not that He's comfortable, He's enjoying it. No, He's uncomfortable with that. He cannot take it. He cannot accept it. And that is how God views sin. That's why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, This is the message we've heard from Him and declare to you, God is light. In Him, there is no darkness at all. He cannot stand anything. In, uh, there is darkness. He cannot tolerate it. It is something that eats Him up on the inside. That's how much... It, I mean, if I were to literally put it, we must understand that God absolutely hates sin. He cannot tolerate it. He cannot exist with it. He says it's so disgusting. But yet, this point I'm talking about here is that we have a God of patience. Because if you come back to what I read in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Yes, it says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. But look at this next line. But then this prophet asks, Why then do you still tolerate the treacherous? Why then, God, do you still tolerate sin? Why then do you still tolerate sinners? Why then do you still put up with all of us? Very simple. Because He is a God of patience. He is a God who is long-suffering towards us. If it means that he suffers and he has to endure it, he has to run, he will do so for our sakes. That is how patient God is with us. 2 Peter 3 9, we talked about it two weeks ago. The Lord isn't being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. Again, if you go and look at other translations in the New King James Version, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What this verse is saying there is that God absolutely cannot tolerate sin. Meaning that if there's sin in our lives, we should be destroyed immediately. And God cannot tolerate it at all. But yet, there's the other side of God where He's such a patient and, and a long-suffering God, which means that even though it hurts Him, it pains Him, it angers Him, He will tahan it, He will be patient, He will be long-suffering towards us. Why? Because ultimately, His desire is not to act out on, based on His anger. His desire is for all of us to return to Him in repentance. See, we are the chief of sinners. You are the chief of sinners. The person you're left in, right, they are the chief of sinners. But yet God is a God of patience. He is patient towards each and every one of us. Now let me go a little bit deeper on this. And I think it's something important I need to talk to all of you about. See, one of the problems that we have in the church today is that we begin to separate, or rather let me say this, we, we begin to have a misguided understanding on what sin is. What do I mean by that? one thing that's crept into the church is that we tend to separate sin from the sinner. We tend to separate sin from the sinner. I'm sure we've all heard this phrase before. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Right? I'm sure many of us have heard that before. Now, I agree with that. It is correct. But there's a lot more to that as well, you know? Okay? We must understand how God views sin for us to actually appreciate that. You see, sometimes we think this, you know, oh, hate the sin, uh, love the sinner. And the more we say that, we, we unintentionally separate sin from the sinner. But can I tell you this right now? Sin cannot be separated from the sinner. Without a sinner, is there sin? No. It takes someone to commit that sin. What is sin? Sin is an action. That Sin is not something tangible. God doesn't punish sin, you know. God punishes sinners. If you read about God's judgment, think about it. Since we talk about judgment, think about it in a legal court. Okay, if there's some kind of crime that's been committed, 
Finally, when the judge pronounces that sentence, let's say this guy is a thief, he has stolen something. At the end of the day, what does the judge say? The judge says, you are sentenced to X number of years in prison, right? The judge doesn't say, I sentence, the, I, this guy is you're, you're a thief, I therefore I sentence this concept of thievery to prison. Think about that for a moment. That doesn't make sense. The judge cannot punish thievery. Thievery is an action. He cannot punish that. Who does he punish? He punishes the thief. Okay? You can talk about any kind of wrongdoing. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about lying. Okay? If, any, if, any, if you ever hear anybody say, well, you know, I, I, I hate lies. You know, if you ever say you hate lies, you know what it means? It means you hate liars. If you say you hate lies, you hate lies. Why? Because a lie does not exist without a liar. Someone has to tell that lie. And you say, well, I cannot stand lies. You know what? Then there'll be no lies if there are no liars. What you're actually saying is that, you see, we cannot split these two things. You see, we often like to treat it uh, like as though sin is this thing in our life, right? That well, Jesus will do some kind of magic, you know. Well, he'll go into our body, he'll pull out this thing called sin. And then you've got this, like, I don't know, this blob of black colour thing floating in the air. This is called sin. And then God's wrath and anger will punish that sin and then you are free. No, you know. Sin belongs to the sinner. Sin is something that the sinner has. And I want to point out something for us to understand Scripture. Romans chapter 9, verse 22 says this, you know, God has chosen to show His wrath, His anger, and make His power known, born with great patience, us. What is the us here? The objects of His wrath. The objects of His wrath. Means that when it's time for judgment, it's time for punishment, that is poured out on us. It is poured out on the sinner. But yet, again, you know, we say, well, pastor, you keep talking about this thing, well, it feels very gloom, very doom, very bleak kind of thing. I'll tell you this, there's so much hope there. The more we realize how much, how terrible a sinner we are, the more we can actually see hope. Because right there in that same verse, verse 22, what does God say? He says, although he chose to show his wrath and make his power known, he bore with us with great patience. He bore with us with great long suffering. He's patient with us. And then if you read on to Romans 9 verse 23, the immediate next verse, it says this, What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy? Objects of His mercy. By right, His wrath is His full right to pour out His wrath and His anger and His punishment and His judgment on us. But instead, He chooses to, pay, to be patient, to bear with us, to long suffer in that sense. And then He makes us his, the objects of His mercy. He shows mercy towards us. And today I want to tell you this, you know, the reality we have to understand is this, church, listen to me very carefully. God hates sin. And God hates the sinner as well. God cannot tolerate the sinner as well. But yet, God loves the sinner at the same time. And He chooses to be patient to that sinner. Now, some of you may think that, well, this doesn't make sense. Actually, it makes perfect sense. Because if you go and study what Jesus taught us about love, what did Jesus say? Jesus taught us to love our enemies. Love our enemies. And you know, God Himself has, always, has already shown us what this means. Because when we were sinners, that means we have become enemies of God. And when we were enemies of God, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, means while we were still enemies of God, while we still were living in sin, while we still had sin in our life, God sent Jesus Christ to die for us that we may become His righteousness. And when we finally understand this, when you understand how God actually views sin, how much God hates sin, and with that, the person who commits a sin as well, that's where you appreciate God's grace. That's where a verse like Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 always gets me. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. We are not consumed, meaning this, we should be consumed, but we have not been consumed. Why? Because He is patient to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, famous chapter about love, what does verse 4 say? Verse 4 starts off saying, love is patient. Again, go back to another version, it says, love suffers long. Love is willing to suffer 
for a long time, bearing with the other person, even though we cannot stand it, even though we cannot tolerate it, and God is that same way towards each and every one of us. He looks at us, He bears with us, even though He can, and in, in, in some sense you can even say He should destroy us immediately, but He chooses not to, because love is patient, love suffers long, and God is, God is patient towards each and every one of us. And so today, these are the two things I want to share with all of us. Today, I, I keep saying, if there's anything I want to take home, is this, that you and I, we are the chief of sinners. We are the worst of sinners. And that doesn't mean that there's no hope. In fact, when we understand that, then we can appreciate the hope that God gives us. Then we can understand just how amazing God's grace is for all of us. Because what hope is there for a sinner like me, like you, like all of us here, is these two things. Number one, we have a God of possibilities. He doesn't write you off based on the problems. Instead, He doesn't see problems, He sees possibilities in your life. He wants to use you. He wants to work through you. And not only that, He's not only just a God of possibilities, He is a God of patience. That He's, he long, he's long-suffering towards us. He will be patient. He bears with each and every one of us. And today, as we close off this time, all of us need to come back to this truth today that you and I we are the chief of sinners and for me as a pastor the more I serve as a pastor the more and more aware I become of this I believe maybe that's why it took someone like Paul to pen down these words that he's the chief of sinners because the more you serve God the more God calls you to do things the more you realize you don't deserve to do any of this the more you realize you keep stumbling you keep messing up hey Paul also wrote he's not a perfect man huh? Paul is the one who said hey the things I want to do I don't do the things I ought to do I don't do instead the things I don't want to do the evil that I shouldn't be doing I end up doing all the time but it's only when you come to the place of realizing how sinful we are then you can open yourself up to understand and begin to receive the grace of God. As we close off today's sermon, I want to show us a video testimony. And this video testimony, some of you may have seen it online, but it's about a pastor, and her name is uh, Pastor Trifina, and she shares how she struggled through her own uh, life with her sexuality, with her... Uh, at one point, she talks about how she was a sex addict as well. And she shares about how she struggled with many of these things while she was a pastor. But yet, it's this, you know, in her own journey, she realizes how she's the chief of all sinners. But yet in that, she realizes and understands God's grace and mercy. And so I just want us to sit back and watch this uh, testimony. And, and after that, we'll close this service. But I trust you'll be blessed by her story. I'm sorry. Sorry for using you, a few of you. Opening doors in your sexuality. I took advantage of you. And one of you knocked on death's door. Thankfully, you, you didn't go through with the suicide. But I never truly understood your despair till years later. When I knocked on death's door myself. Looking back, I still remember the pain so clearly. She called to tell me our three-year relationship was over. She said it's because I'm not a man. She was seeing a man behind my back. Ever since childhood, I needed to be the man to protect my friends, be the surrogate husband to my mother, to be a better man than my father was. I tried to be better, but was not man enough for her. The night of our breakup felt like the longest night of my life. I look around our house filled with memories of our love. She was the first lady I found fulfillment in. Out of all the ladies I was with, we met while I was in the seminary, Bible school. Finally, a Christian like me, 
we share common values. We could even study the Bible together. Well, some chapters at least. Other parts of the Bible we avoided when we were together because we knew what we were doing was not the kind of love God intended. I held on because of the hope that we could at least do life together. Forever? Or so I thought. I left the house determined to die. I couldn't care about the many children and youth who look up to me, always wanting to talk with Pastor Trifina. Yes, I became a pastor after years in seminary. I managed to hide my lesbian ways from the world. But I couldn't hide from myself. I served a 24-hour notice and I left my job as a pastor. I was done meeting all their expectations. I left church with so much pain. Pain from causing hurt to the people that I love and I respected. I felt unworthy. I was done. No more mommy's good girl. No more Christian club president, no more pastor, no more people pleaser, no more protector of the weak. I started to pray on the weak. I was going to exercise true freedom. I went online and hooked up with many people. I became a sex addict. My porn habits got so out of control. I even tried sex with men just to try and feel normal. Sex got meaningless and tiring. I knew I needed help. After 10 years of wandering and self-indulgence, I turned back to God. I plucked up the strength to trust God again. Part of my healing process required me to humble myself, to seek forgiveness from others, and forgive myself. I struggled with the person in the mirror. I was always teased as Miss Piggy in school because of my size. At the back of my mind, I held on the thought that I was at least beautiful inside. But my brokenness caught up with me. I felt ugly outside and inside. I asked God if I could ever be made beautiful. If, if I could ever be unbroken, I came to understand that to be unbroken, I had to piece back the dark holes in my life. I had to process my painful past and forgive the neighborhood girl who laid on top of me and kissed me on the lips when I was just six. She was also six. But I guess there was a lot going on in her own family. Her elder sister stood there and watched the act of my sexual awakening with me. Frozen, helpless. That was the first time I felt shame. I had to forgive my father for allowing the access of pornography videos in the house. I got hooked before I even knew what addiction was. I had to forgive my mom, who burdened me with family problems. I felt I was robbed of a childhood to her if I wanted love. I had to earn it. I also had to forgive the first woman who baited me only to mock me. Because hurt people hurt people. I wanted to hurt no more. It took around 20 years to now say, I am beautiful. I didn't do it by myself. God's hand was present every step of the way. I just cannot deny His power. Today, I'm a pastor at PLUC, pursuing liberty under Christ. My team and I journey with Christians struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. We shower them with love, acceptance, tears, and truth. We also journey with their families and church community. 
we show them that grace and acceptance doesn't mean compromise. You know what? Jesus sat and dined with sinners and the tax collectors during his time. He showed them the truth while showing them grace and acceptance as well. You know, they received hard truth, yet they were still following Jesus and wanted more from Him. Why? Because Jesus showed love and Jesus walked His talk. And that is the kind of freedom to love that I want to exemplify today. Come on, just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, when I first heard the story, I suppose one of the reasons why I could really empathize with Trifina is that struggle when you're a pastor. We may all go through our own different struggles, but there are times we feel like we're we don't deserve anything. How, how can we be doing this job? And I, it really broke my heart when, I, when, when she said that she, she left that job. When she first, I mean, she was a pastor. She resigned because she just couldn't take that pressure and, and that whole struggle. And I know that because I've been in that place before where I thought maybe I should leave as well. I don't deserve to do this. But it's very often only when you come to the end of yourself and you and you come to the beginning of God and you say, Lord, help me. And when you realize that you can be the worst of all sinners, but no matter what, God is a God of possibilities. And God is a God of patience. He, he waits for us. He puts up with us. Not so that at the end of the day, He stands there and says, ah, you see, like, I tell you, like that one, you get into trouble. No, he, he does that because He loves us. And He never stops reaching out to each and every one of us here. And today, I want all of us as a church to come to the understanding of just how much of a sinner we are. But when we truly understand that, that is when we are able to truly receive and appreciate God's amazing grace. I've always thought this and every time I think about that hymn Amazing Grace and it's talk about Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me sometimes you know why grace is not amazing to us why it says Amazing Grace how sweet the sound sometimes Amazing Grace is neither amazing it's not sweet you know why because we don't realise how wretched we are but when we do then you begin to see that even though I was an enemy with God, God still chose to send Jesus to die for our sins. We did not do anything to deserve that. We did not do anything to earn it. But instead, God chose to come and forgive us. He chose to come and set us free. You know, today I want to just end off saying this. Scripture tells us that if you talk about this, Paul says that we are the chief of sinners. There's another part of the scripture that says something else. That you and I were the chief of sinners, but Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. And what does a chief shepherd do? Matthew 18, verses 12 to 14. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In that same way, it's not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Today, the Lord looks at all of us and His desire is for none of us to perish, for none of us to go on life without knowing His amazing grace for each and every one of us. And today, maybe there's some of us here who don't know that amazing grace. And I pray that you come to know that. Can I just invite us to just close our eyes and bow our heads 
all over this place from the front to the back just going to close off this time with a moment for us to respond but today I believe that there's some of us here maybe you've you're here for the first time or you're here for a few times already but you've never responded to receive Jesus into your life well as I close off this service I want to give an opportunity to respond and today I want to tell you this maybe you feel that you're alright you can make it through life you're not a terrible person you're not a bad person well I, I believe all of us we don't want to be bad people but the truth is is that we have sin in our lives we are sinners and we must face up to that we may not be the worst but yet we know we've done wrong things in our lives doesn't matter small or big you know that you're not perfect you know you've told a lie you know that you have done things you should not have done you know you've said words that you should not have said you know that you've hurt people in ways that you should not have hurt them we are, we are all sin the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of God's standard and because of that sin the Bible says the wages of sin is death it means we've sinned in our lives we deserve death. This death is not just a physical death. It's a spiritual death. It's an eternal destruction. And God does not want to see that happen to us. That's why He sent Jesus to die on the cross as a sacrifice. That's why the Bible says, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf. He took on, He became he took on all our sins and it's like as though we had never sinned. He became the worst sinner ever. And on that cross, why Jesus suffered on that cross was not just the physical pain, but all of, of God's wrath and God's judgment had to come upon Him because He was bearing all that sin. He became that biggest, that worst, that sole sinner in the world. And then, is amazing grace that He would do that for us so that you and I today can find new life. Today, if you've never given your life to Jesus before, I want to tell you this, that it's no accident, it's no coincidence that you're here. You're here because God is calling out to you. God is reaching out to you. Just like we just read how sometimes that one sheep wanders away and the shepherd will do everything he can to reach out to that one sheep. Today, you're here because God, Christ, your, that, that chief shepherd is calling out to you. He's calling, calling out to you to come home to Him. And if today you've never prayed that prayer to receive Jesus in your life, but you know you need to respond. Maybe you want to respond. Maybe you don't even understand every single thing, but you know you just need to respond. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer is a prayer specially designed for you to respond, say you want to follow Jesus all the days of your life. And here's what I'm going to do. I'll say this prayer out loud. I want you to follow along with me as well. I'll say it line by line. You say everything I say line by line. Follow after me word for word. And I want all of you here, all of us at the youth service here, I want us to pray together so that no one will be praying it alone this afternoon. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer right now. And all of us here, I want you to pray this out loud. Just say this along with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Come on, just say it again. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for your great love for me. That you are a God of patience. That you are a God of patience. And a God of possibilities. And a God of possibilities. Today, Today I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. But I believe. But I believe. That you sent your son Jesus. That you sent your son Jesus. To die for me. To die for me. And because of that. Because of that. Today, today, I am restored. I am, restored. I am made, perfect I'm made perfect in your image. In your image. Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart Come, to into you. My life. Come into my life. You are my Lord. You are my, Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Savior. I, want to follow you I want to follow you all the days of my life. All the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. With all our heads bowed and our eyes still closed, I believe that there's some of us here who prayed this prayer for the first time. And if that's you, here's what I'm going to do. With no, no one looking around, in a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. 
And the moment I say three, if you pray this prayer with me for the first time, I want you to lift your hand straight up wherever you are. By lifting your hand up, you're saying, Pastor, I pray along with you. I want you to lift your hand up because I want to see who you are. I want to see where you are because I want to speak a word of blessing over you. And maybe you didn't lift up your hand just now, but maybe you were quietly praying in your heart or perhaps you didn't do anything at all, but right now, you know you need to respond. Maybe you don't even know why you need to respond, but there's something in your spirit telling you that you need to respond. At the count of three, you lift your hand straight up because I want to speak a word of blessing over you. So with all our heads bowed and all our eyes closed, no one moving around, no one looking around, in this very special moment, don't let this opportunity pass you by. You lift your hand up at the count of three. I'm going to count right now. One, two, and three. Just lift your hand straight up wherever you are. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, yes, I see your hand over there. Just keep it lifted up. Is there anyone else? Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't put it down. Just keep it lifted up because I want to speak a word of blessing over you. Lord, I thank you for those hands that have been lifted up because every hand represents a life and a soul. Lord, I commit our friends into your hands and I want to speak this word of blessing over you that the Lord says this. Sometimes we may feel like we're not worthy. We may feel like we don't deserve anything. But God says this, no matter what you have done or what you may do, I will never leave you and I will never abandon you. So I bless you in the name of Jesus. Today, may the Lord give you a new life and a new spirit and a new heart. I commit you into His hands. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray you can put your hands down. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Can we just put our hands together? Can we thank God for His word and thank God for those who have responded? And I'd like all of us to stand right now. Well, today, we're going to close off just doing a few, a few things. Well, firstly, when we worship the Lord, some of us, we need to come and confess our sins. Some of you may say, huh, but Pastor, last week, Pastor Kwan already asked us to come and confess our sins. The week before, you also asked us to come and confess our sins. You know what? Repentance and confession is something we do every day. Because we fall into sin. Let me, let, me be, let me be open with you right now. Since last week, I have fallen into sin as well. I have done things I should not have done. But today, I want to come and get right with the Lord. All of us must come and get right with the Lord. You see, weakness is not coming before God to get right before Him. Weakness is when we don't come and get right before God. You know why? Then sin gets a bigger and bigger hold in your life. So the Bible tells us when you confess your sin, it's like exposing something to the light. You know, when, if you talk about, if you talk about uh, um, uh, things that spoil, like mold or whatever, when things fester, it's because we keep it in the dark. But once it's exposed to that light, it cannot exist anymore. And God will come, will come through in our life. So some of us, we need to respond in that area. The, the rest of us, another group of us, you feel absolutely worthless. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've done. But you feel absolutely worthless. And you feel because of that, there's no hope. Because you feel like, why would God bother about someone like me? Let me tell you this, God will bother about all of us. God is a God of possibilities. He's a God of patience. Today, there's nothing you have done that can make Him turn His face away from you. Today, He's calling you back. If you, are, if you will humble yourself and come before Him in repentance, God will hear your prayers. Today, He wants to bring about restoration. And there's some of us here. I don't know how many of you here, but I want to open up this time if there are any of you here that your prayer is to learn to hate sin more and more I want, to, I want you to come forward and be prayed over as well let me just explain this it's important for us to hate sin because when we truly hate sin that's when we, are, we will get rid of it see some of us I'm sure you know some of us you, some of you may be thinking right now pastor I've Every time service, I come and confess my sin. Every week I tell myself, I come and confess it again and again. But I keep falling into it. You know why? Because it's a habit, it's addicted, and because we don't hate it that much. In fact, we do enjoy it to some sense. That's why we keep falling back into it. That's why there's, there's, there's this pastor by the name of Paul Washer. He says this, The Christian can no longer stomach the sin upon which he once fed with delight, but he must become repulsed by it, nauseated by his participation in it. Thus, he must confess it and be rid of it. You know, this is not going to happen naturally. It will happen supernaturally. It is something that God will work in your life. And if today you know that the only way you can find victory over that sin is through Christ, 
then you need to come forward as well. Maybe you've been defeated. You feel like you you keep falling into this sin. I don't know what it is. Maybe you maybe you are addicted to pornography. You're addicted to something. Maybe some of you are struggling in some area of life. Maybe some of you here today, you come to church every week, but you know you don't really mean it. You come to church every week, but you know you go back home and you you use use uh, profane language all the time. Maybe some of you here, you're addicted to smoking. Whatever it is, you need to come and get right with the Lord today. You must say, Lord, I want to come to a place where I, I cannot tolerate that sin. I cannot have that desire. And today I want to tell you, if you come to the Lord, there is hope. We're going to close this time by singing this song, Living Hope. See, He is our living hope. You are the chief of sinner, but the only way you can get out of that is to come back to the living hope. There is Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you're done, why don't we lift up our hands over this place? Let me just speak this word of prayer over you. If you're done, if you're at the front, you're done with prayer, just stand up and so just lift up your hands to the Lord. I just want to speak this blessing over you. Over all of you right now, I want to say this. In the name of Jesus, the Lord has made you pure and righteous. That by the work of the cross today, you are set free from every single power of darkness, every work of sin. And if there's any of you, you feel like you're trapped, you're caught in that, the Word of God says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So today, I speak freedom upon you. I speak the Lord's strength and courage that you will always be an overcomer. That as you know that how we are, how we always fall short of God's standard, you will still know that God's amazing grace is always here for you. He is always in your life. So I bless you with this today. Today, I say this to all of you that Jesus Christ is your hope He is your hope for freedom He is your hope for salvation He is the hope that for you to live a life of purity and righteousness so I set all of you apart right now and, and, and all of you I want to bless you with this that you will rise up to be a righteous generation that in all that you do you will be holy and pure and even when you fail you will always come back to our Lord, our God, who will restore you and who will make you clean. He will make you as white as snow. So today, I set you apart in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give all the praise to the Lord. And let's come and declare this again. Hallelujah. He has set us free. So let's come and worship Him right now. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. 